So, welcome back everyone to another episode. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the skeletal system and everything you should know about it for the purposes of the MCAT. So the first thing we're going to talk about is sort of the different functions that bone has within our body. And so the first one I have here on the left is support. So, obviously, you know, if we didn't have our skeletal system, we would be more of a blob on the ground than an actual upright person. Um, and so obviously our skeletal system thus has to provide some sort of framework for the rest of our organs and like, you know, muscles and stuff to be attached to. So that's pretty intuitive, right? Next is movement. Movement is also obviously in order to be able to move different, you know, parts of our body, for example, our arms or legs, we have muscles pulling different bones closer together. And that contraction is what ultimately allows for coordinated movement. So movement is going to be the second uh, main function of bone. The third is going to be protection. So we have different structures, kind of like our skull uh, at the top of our head. And then you're going to also have like, you know, your ribs and your vertebrae and all of that fun stuff. Those are going to help protect different organs within your body. So in the case of the skull, protecting your brain. In the case of your vertebrae, connect, like protecting that spine. And then in the case of your rib cage, we're going to be uh, basically protecting like, you know, important structures like your heart and your lungs, right? So protection is another important function. Next, we have one that's not really talked about too, uh, too much, but we have the storage of calcium and phosphate. So a significant portion of our bone is actually inorganic cellular, uh, inorganic matrix that's going to go ahead and compose roughly a third of the overall matrix itself. And we use that to store calcium and phosphate in what are called calcium phosphate crystals or hydroxyapatite. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But we need calcium and phosphate for a variety of functions within the body, whether that's going to be helping us with, you know, contractions of muscles or if that's going to be with within signaling pathways, uh, phosphorylation, you can think of, you know, basically every single kinase like cascade involves some sort of, uh, some sort of phosphate usage. So both calcium and phosphate are going to play important roles within biochemistry and we need a place to store excess uh, calcium and phosphate in case we need to access it for those processes down the line. Next we have hematopoiesis and so this is basically the generation of cells that are derived from within the bone marrow and there's a variety of different types whether that's going to be your you know red blood cells your megakaryocytes or even just talking about your immune system which is the final category we're going to be talking about in terms of function and your bones again overall the purpose of this is I, I'm not trying to go into too much depth about it right now but I just want you to see that this is a very dynamic environment it's involved in so many different processes and although like you know bones might be something that you know you might find from you know fossils or something like that that have been buried in the ground that look like they've been like that forever in reality it's an extremely dynamic environment that our bodies take advantage of in so many different ways for so many different functions so the first thing that I want to talk with you all about um, after we go through this overview is going to be what kinds of ways can we break down bones? How do we classify them? And the two main ones you should know for the MCAT are the differences between the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton is going to be composed of your skull, your basically your vertebrae that you know help to protect your spine, your ribs, basically all of the stuff down in the center of your body, right? And your appendicular skeleton, as the name suggests, is what's going to be, you know, composing your appendages or the parts of your skeleton that are going to connect to the appendages. So over here you have your scapula, for example, that's going to be attached to the humerus. And this is all going to be a part of your appendicular skeleton. Down here you have the pelvis and then, you know, attached to your, fever, or your femur. Um, and that's going to be, you know, making up components of the appendicular skeleton. So axial skeleton is the central part, and appendicular skeleton refers to almost like your appendages. That's the mnemonic I used to remember that. But next, we can talk about the different types of bones that we have within our body. So firstly, we have our long bones, and as the name suggests, these bones are a lot longer than they are wide. But, you know, a little, like, offshoot of long bones are short bones, which I've noted over here. And an example of a short bone... Is the one I've just drawn here, where you can see the width is approximately the same as the length of the bone. And these are super common in areas kind of like in your wrists. You have a ton of bones that help make up your wrist, and those have a bunch of sliding motion, and those would be like all excellent examples of short bones. But with regards to long bones, uh, these are super important for you know hematopoiesis and all of that fun stuff. Um, but like common examples that the MCAT might bring up would be things kind of like your humerus, which is in, you know, your arms, you have your femur, your tibia, all of these are examples of long bones that you should be familiar with for the MCAT. Um, although you don't have to have a crazy knowledge of anatomy for the MCAT, it really helps to have good examples that you can sort of latch onto to understand what these different types of bones are. 
Next, we have flat bones, which, as the name suggests, are flat. So, you know, these ones are very much long on the side. But flat bones are overall, you can just think of them as, you know, as the name suggests, they're flat. And this is kind of like your scapula or your soldier, or your, not soldier voice, your shoulder blade, uh, which makes up the back. Um, kind of like they're, they're um, what's the word for it? They're, they're called wing bones informally, right? But in reality, these glide over the back of your ribs and they assist you with basically creating like sort of a pocket for your humerus to sort of slot into. And that's what's going to actually allow you to move your shoulder, right? That's what's going to help provide stability for that area in that ball and socket joint. Now, a couple little extra things to note about the flat bone is that we have sutural bones, right? Which are bones that actually comprise the skull. And the skull is super interesting because we have these bones that have these joints in between them and there are actually a variety of different types of bones that make up your skull it's not one big bone and what happens is as you grow up and you know you get older eventually these bones start to fuse with one another and they form these like fibrous joints but obviously we can't move like the bones in our skull and so these are going to be very solid very rigid joints that are immovable joints and we'll get into that in a little bit but what these little connection points down the middle are called is suture. So that's where sutural bones come in. And then sesamoid, sesamoid bones um, are basically like a good example of that would be like the patella, but these are like smaller bones that are like more like circular in shape. Um, and so yeah, that's what you should know about flat bones. Um, and we'll get into like kind of how all of these like originate and the processes that go about like development of bone um, in a little bit. But overall, we've talked about long bones and flat bones. And then finally, we have irregular bones. And what you should note about these is that they're really, as the name suggests, irregularly shaped. So these are bones that aren't necessarily super long. They're not necessarily super flat. They have like a very unique geometry. So an example would be your pelvis. This over here isn't necessarily a part of your pelvis. It's actually the sacrum, which you know connects to the rest of the spinal column. And you have your coccyx down here. But your pelvis is a very like... I hate to use the word organic here because, you know, obviously everything in the body is like most of the stuff is organic, but it's a very like dynamic and like fluid shape, um, which is like super unique. And another example would be your vertebrae themselves. Like these are very like wacky shapes and stuff. And so it's really hard to classify it as either like, you know, a long bone or a flat bone. And so we call those irregular bones. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the bone structure. So now we've talked, you know, first we introduced the idea of like, you know, what are bones good for? Then we talked about like, you know, what are the axial and appendicular skeletons? And then the long, flat, irregular bones. But like, what exactly is like the anatomy of like an individual bone? And let's start from the macro level before we work our way over to the osteons, which are the structural units of bones. So for flat bones, they have the periosteum, peri meaning around, and then osteum meaning bone. So osseous tissue is equal to bone tissue. And periosteum just means it's around the bone. It's a, it's a connective tissue that encapsulates a bone. And then after that, we have this like gray layer that I've drawn here. And this gray layer is compact or cortical bone. This is where our osteons are actually going to be located. And then finally in the middle, there's a trabecular, cancellus, or spongy bone. Basically, this is like not nearly as dense as compact bone, but it composes kind of the center of our flat bone sandwich. Um, and so that's the basic anatomy of a flat bone. All right, so next we're going to talk about long bones. And so long bones uh, are very similar to flat bones in many, many ways. However, there are some important distinctions that you can know. Firstly, we should talk about sort of like the general structure of a long bone. So a long bone, as opposed to having this sandwich-like format, is much more like oriented in terms of like the length of it. There's different segments that correspond to different things. So just as with the uh, flat bones that we showed earlier, they have the periosteum, which, like as you can see over here, is like around. It's it encapsulates it encapsulates the entire bone, and then we have our compact bone, you know, just like that. But then after that, we have in this area over here on this side, which is called the epiphyses, you know, epi meaning like around or on the end. Uh, we have our trabecular tissue. We have we have we have the trabecular bone or the spongy bone, you know, that like porous thing that's kind of in the middle, but we don't have it in the center. In the center, we actually have a nice hollow, oh, let me change the color of that so you can actually see. This area is hollow, you know? 
and meaning that you know it doesn't have that like spongy bone that we saw earlier instead what it has is yellow bone marrow so bone marrow is incredibly important and serves a variety of functions uh, for us within our body but the two critical ones is that yellow bone marrow will help us out with fat storage and red bone marrow is going to help us out with hematopoiesis so your red bone marrow tends to be concentrated more towards the epiphyses, the ends of the bone itself. As you can see here, I've tried to sort of like, you know, draw out the density as being a little bit more dense here than it is over here, with the yellow bone marrow being concentrated in the center, or what we call the diaphyses of the bone. But ultimately, red bone marrow is going to be where hematopoiesis takes place. So this is where we get new erythrocytes or new red blood cells, and yellow bone marrow is going to be where we store fat within the bone, which is ultimately super important. So hopefully, you know, this makes a little bit of sense for long bones. First of all, understand that we have our epiphyses, which make up the ends of the long bone, and our diaphysis, which makes up the center of the bone. You can think diameter is the super long part of a circle, or the longest part of a circle. And so the diaphysis is the longest part of the bone. It's kind of going down the lengthwise. That's a helpful mnemonic for remembering that. And that our red bone marrow is concentrated towards the ends of the bone, at the epiphyses and also a little bit into the diaphyses. But at the center of the diaphyses, there is a hollow opening, which is where the yellow bone marrow is stored. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the breakdown of long bones. Next, we can talk about sort of the bone matrix that actually makes up the, uh, the actual structure of the bone. So as I mentioned earlier, one third of bone is going to be inorganic. However, two thirds of bone is going to be organic. And there's actually two different, there, there's, there's an important reason for this. So when I think of organic stuff, you know, I think of cells, I think of things that are like fluid and like able to like, you know, move around and like biological membranes and yada, yada, yada. But I think flexibility when I think of, you know, biological stuff and organic material. And you can, when you think of flexibility, think tensile strength, all right? Tensile is like your ability to like stretch, you know, like think of rubber band, for example, that's able to stretch a lot without actually snapping. And so it gives the bone a little bit of give, right? And that provides us with the ability to not be so brittle, not to break like immediately, right? And so the, we get this primarily from the proteins that are within the bone, but also from collagen. Now, if you're especially observant, you'll know that collagen is actually just a type of structural uh, protein. But it's so prevalent within the bone that I thought it would be worth including here as well. But the important thing is that two-thirds of our bone is actually organic and contributes to the tensile strength or the, the resisting like stretching forces on the bone. But the other third of our bone, and this is the one that people tend to talk about more, is inorganic, meaning that it provides strength and rigidity through, as I mentioned earlier, these hydroxyapatite crystals. And this chemical structure here, I can erase this so that you can see, uh, it's probably, you're probably not going to have to memorize this for the MCA, but it's important to break down the different components of it. So we have calcium, you know, which we talked about earlier, and we have phosphate. And both of these are used for a variety of processes within the body. And so our calcium, obviously, if we have excess calcium, we need to store it somewhere. But if we also need calcium for a variety of processes that we may have to complete, you know, for whatever reason it may be within the body, we need to be able to access it from somewhere. And the same exact thing is true for phosphate. Just think of this like OH2 as like basically helping to like sort of balance out the, the charge of the, the crystals themselves. Um, not particularly important. So that is what the organic and inorganic components of the bone matrix are sort of like broken down for y'all. Um, and again, if you ever have any questions about this topic, feel free to go ahead and comment down below and I'll try to like help you out with that uh, to the best of my ability. But next, let's talk about the osteons. And the osteons are actually the main structural component of bone. And so there's a good analogy that I think I've, I've learned to use when like kind of like trying to teach this to other people. And that's to think of the osteon as sort of like almost like a city, right? And the idea is that we have people that live within our city and we need to get resources to them because obviously it's really hard to like do things yourself. And so it like really, really helps out if you're able to like, you know, navigate like resources throughout, you know, your city through like a framework of highways and roads to get them down to individual people. And so that's how we're going to be looking at that through the lens of kind of like that like street uh, analogy. And so at first you can think of the interstate as these have version canals. So we have resources coming in from our body. Obviously, you know, our heart is like pumping blood uh, throughout 
uh, pretty much everywhere, right? But we need to get that blood and get it down to like the individual houses. You don't have houses that are immediately connected to like freeways and stuff like that, um, unless you like live out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but haversion canals can be an example of like an interstate. These are like bringing in you know, tons and tons and tons of resources, but we need to filter that down to the actual cells, which are, you know, you can think of like the little houses that are within this area. So we break off of the Haversian canals and go into Volkman's canals. Now Volkman's canals are perpendicular to Haversian canals. And again, there's a little mnemonic that I like to use. It's this little V over here, and there's a little 90 degree uh, within that V. And so you can think of it as like 90 degrees off of the Haversian canals. But these are going to help basically take us, like break off that traffic just a little bit more, almost like an exit ramp off of that interstate. And then we need to like, there's no houses off of exit ramps, right? You need to go a little bit further, go through like some more streets before you actually reach houses. And so the next level past the Volkman's canals are going to be the canaliculi, which are going to supply nutrients to our cells. So these are you know, a little foreshadowing here, osteocytes. But now we've finally gone from our Haversian canals to our Volkmann's canals, and then finally the canaliculites. Now, the really cool thing about osteons, though, is that they're arranged in such a way uh, that they have these layers. Now, you know, almost think like Shrek, for example, onions have layers, osteons have layers, and they have layers that are concentric rings. You know, concentric just meaning like, you know, orient, like it's a circle within a circle within a circle. And at the center, we have our Haversian canals. You can think of this as like coming out of the page. We have our Volkmann's canals, you know, that are going to be going sideways and stuff. And finally, we have our canaliculis that are going to be stretching around and like connecting everything up. And these are going to be the actual, like, think of these as like the street roads that are going to be getting like nutrients to their final destination, which is within these lacunae. Now, I've taken Latin for a couple of years, and let me tell you, this is like the one time it pays off because lacunae is actually Latin for tear, you know? And, you know, hopefully you don't have too many tears while studying for the MCAT, but you can use those to help you remember like what these structures look like. These are little teardrops that are little openings within the in between each of the lamellae. And within each one of these lacunae, there live happy little, I mean, I don't know if they're happy, but little osteocytes. And these osteocytes, we'll get to them, are ultimately the houses that we need to deliver resources to. And so I hope that makes a little bit of sense in terms of how we're getting resources from this huge interstate that has a bunch of traffic, bunch of trucks coming through, how we're actually getting that down to the level of the osteocytes. It's the Haversian Canal to the Volkman's Canals, through the canaliculi, at the lamellae, and then into the lacunae themselves, where our osteocytes are. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. But now we're going to talk about the different cell types that are actually found in the bone. And so the first ones that we talked about are the osteocytes. Uh, and so osteocytes, I put a picture of Drake here with like, you know, hotline bling, because you can really think about them almost as like surveyors. They're the ones that keep track of like what's going on. And they're a relay station, kind of like, uh, like almost like a hotline. It's like they're taking in information, they're sending out information. Like basically they're able to like navigate uh like figure out what's going on and relay those messages to the nearby cells so that we're able to like, you know, adjust things as we go. So 90 to 95% of all bone cells are actually osteocytes. I'm not talking about osteoblasts. I'm not talking about osteoclasts. Those are not subdivisions of osteocytes. Those are their own types of cells. I'm saying 19 to 95% of all bone cells are actually osteocytes specifically, meaning that they're almost like these little sentries or these little, you know, like stations where like information is coming in and out. They can live up to 25 years, which is pretty crazy. Most cells have a pretty fast turnover, but these ones are chugged along for a while. And they're derived from what are called mesenchymal stem cells, okay? So remember, these are all going to be derived from that hematopoietic stem cell, um, and they're, they're super amazing cells. Uh, and they live in the lacunae, which are the little houses that we talked about that we need to get resources over to from our, from our highway of the Haversian Canal. And finally, you know, as I stated earlier, they help to coordinate bone remodeling. So if you need to remember what do osteocytes do, they help coordinate bone remodeling. But on top of that, we also have two other cells that you probably have heard about before. We have osteoblasts, which are like Bob the Builder, and we have osteoclasts, which are like Pac-Man. So osteoblasts, think 
osteoblasts build, blasts build, because blasts actually add additional bone matrix. So they're laying down new inorganic materials and secreting these hydroxyapatite crystals to expand upon that inorganic matrix. And so they're building new bone. They're taking calcium and phosphate out of the bloodstream and moving it into our bone. All right, and that's going to make the bones nice and big and strong. This is why you're supposed to drink milk. It's why you're supposed to get calcium in your diet. It's to strengthen your bones, and that's the osteoblasts doing that. And osteoclasts do the exact opposite. You can think of the mnemonic clasts consume. You know, we have a C and a C here because they're the ones that are doing the exact opposite of the bone. They are breaking down the excess inorganic matrix and using it to, you know, go ahead and be fueled into blood vessels so that we can use it for whatever purposes that the body needs at that time. And the final type of bone that I want to, the bone cell I want to talk about isn't actually a type of bone cell. It's a cartilage secreting cell called chondrocytes. So chondrocytes, when you see chondro, you can think of cartilage. That's what it stands for. And site just means cells. So these are cartilage cells and they lay down the cartilaginous framework for osteoblasts to build upon. And we're going to get into this a little bit later in terms of endo endochondrial ossification. But basically, we need to have a framework to build upon if we're going to go you know, build like long bones, for example, which is going to be super key. So the four cell types that are worth knowing, osteocytes, you know, osteocytes, they're kind of the sensory stations and they relay information. Osteoblasts build, osteoclasts consume, and chondrocytes establish that cartilaginous framework for osteoblasts to build upon. There are also, at the top I wrote here, osteoprogenitor cells. These cells end up differentiating into osteoblasts. Um, they're a type of multipotent stem cell, uh, and it's really depends like you may have to know that for them cat you may not they might mention it in the passage but i i figured it, it was worth including here um so yeah but now let's talk about how is new bone formed so bone can be formed in two ways and as i've indicated here it can be for the different types of bone that we have so if we're trying to make flat bone let's think about this we are going to go with a process called intramembranous ossification or this is within the membrane ossification and so it basically does not require a cartilage model this is the important part to take away here we do not need a cartilaginous framework to build upon and so we have imagine here let me let me redraw this to help you guys out imagine you have two different types of connective tissue okay you have here and here and you have a thin gap so what can happen is you can have osteoblasts that begin to pile up in this little environment and so the osteoblasts begin to they begin to grow multiply and stuff and they begin secreting new bone matrix but because they're squeezed in between these two tissues they begin secreting a flat bone and if we turn this flat bone on the side like if they if we turn this like matrix on the side that looks a lot like the sandwich that we were pointing at earlier and if this thing kept building out you know it kept building out it would keep going sideways and ultimately we end up producing a flat bone so this is intramembranous ossification. It does not require cartilage to build upon. The osteoblasts emerge there spontaneously, and then they end up secreting, you know, what ends up becoming bone matrix for flat bones. But the other process, and the one that's a little bit more involved, is endochondral ossification. So there's tons of diagrams that you can look up uh, for this online, but I'll basically, I'll give you the gist of it here. So endochondral ossification is gonna be used to create long bones, and so what you have to remember is that this is going to be using cartilage. So we're going to be using cartilage to establish a framework for our osteoblasts to build upon. So first we have our primary ossification center, and we are going to draw that distinction uh, as opposed to the secondary ossification center. So the primary ossification center begins its work when you are still a fetus, a.k.a. you're still inside mom. And so it starts off in the diaphyses, you know, remember we said the diaphyses was going to be the diameter of the bone or the long part of the bone straight in the center. And it's going to begin laying down this pink stuff, which is cartilage. And then afterwards, that's when our osteoblasts come in and they start building over that cartilage and replacing it with bone matrix. And this is when you're still a fetus. You haven't even been born yet. And the way that I, I can remember when the primary ossification center goes to work is that you're born with bones. And so obviously something has to happen. You have to have some kind of bone before you're born, right? 
And when the secondary ossification center takes over, that's that's once you're already once you've been born already, or a little bit before you've been born. And so you can think of that as being between your infant through your teen years. You know, eventually you have to stop growing in length, but most of that growth takes takes place at the epiphyses or at the ends of your bone. And the exact same thing happens. You can see that we had some pink here before we had our yellow, and we laid down that cartilaginous framework before actually you know secreting osseous uh, matrix over that, right? So secondary ossification center takes place at the epiphyses, and again, we go from cartilage over to bone. So that's, that's kind of the important thing to know about endochondral ossification. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is going to be hormonal control of this entire process. And as you can see, I've divided this down into sort of two different uh, sections. So we have three hormones uh, total. We have calcitonin here in green, parathyroid hormone, and calcitriol, which are in red. So calcitonin is going to ultimately end up decreasing the amount of calcium and phosphate we have in the blood. And we're like, okay, what process would end up decreasing calcium and phosphate? And that's got to be laying down new bone matrix, right? That's going to be, you know, taking excess calcium and phosphate from the blood, and we're going to be putting it into our bank, which is kind of like our bones. Um, and to do that, we're going to need osteoblasts because osteoblasts build bone. And so if we want to get rid of calcium that's in the bone, we want to build new bone matrix. And so we're going to upregulate osteoblast activity with calcitonin. And keep in mind that's secreted by the thyroid, all right? But out of the parathyroid gland and the proximal convoluted tubule cells, uh, which are within our kidney, we secrete parathyroid hormone and calcitriol, which is really just vitamin D. And these accomplish the same exact function. They increase osteoclast activity. And osteoclast activity is the exact opposite of osteoblast activity because osteoclasts consume. And so they're breaking down that bone matrix. And if we're breaking down bone matrix, we're increasing the amount of calcium and phosphate which are found within our blood. And so that's the reverse process of what's going on with calcitonin. That's the division that we have here from left side to right side. One side on the left decreases the calcium and phosphate in the blood because we're adding it to the bone matrix. And the opposite side on the right is going to be increasing calcium and phosphate in the blood because we're taking it from our reserves within our bone. And so all three of these important these hormones are incredibly important for you to know. And so there's one last topic that I wanted to go over before ending this video, and that's going to be on the subject of joints and tendons versus ligaments. So really quickly, tendons, uh, tendons are very like th this isn't any crazy, you know, knowledge yet. You can memorize it super easily, but tendons basically help connect muscle to bone. Super easy stuff. And ligaments help us to attach bone to bone. And there's tons of tons and tons of examples um, all over the body. But that's really like kind of like the main thing to know about those. Um, but with regards to joints, there are three overall classifications of joints that you should know for the MCAT. There are the immovable joints. These are like the fibrous joints that we talked about at the beginning um, in your skull. And obviously, you cannot move these. They fuse. And then after that, it, that it's a wrap. All right. Um, another example of an immovable joint would be like your sacrum and your cossacks that are at the end of your spine. This joint right here is fused. It doesn't move at all. And so that's another example of an immovable joint that can be found within the body. All right, so next up we have our slightly movable joints. And a good example of this would be your vertebrae. These are also called cartilaginous joints. And the interesting thing about these is that, as their name implies, they only move a little bit. But the thing is that, like, for example, with your vertebrae, although they only move a little bit, you have so many of them that they're actually like able to have a composite movement that's act that can actually be pretty significant. Like for some people are so flexible that they can literally like, you know, turn their upper body to face like almost completely behind them. And while their individual vertebrae aren't making that significant of a motion, it isn't a 180 degree turn combined, the net effect is that they're able to have a lot more movement. So slightly movable joints are able to, as your name suggests, only move a little bit. And these are also called cartilaginous joints because in, in between each one of these, you know, vertebrae, for example, you have a cartilaginous disc that sits in between them. So that's, that's really important. And then finally, we have our movable joints. These are, you know, the fun ones that uh, you can appreciate uh, for helping you, you know, get around on life. Um, but these are also called synovial joints, and the reason why is we have this synovial capsule that is located 
in between the uh, bones themselves. And so the synovial capsule is filled with synovial fluid. And this is to reduce friction between these bones because these are moving all of the time. And like if you have two surfaces that are running up against each other, they're going to start wearing each other down over time. And we want to try to reduce that. And so you can think of synovial fluid as almost like WD-40 or grease. It's helping to like lubricate this joint and allow it to move without causing too much friction and wear and tear. But on top of that, to help out even more, we actually have cartilage here that lines the inside of the synovial capsule. And this cartilage is a specific type of cartilage. It's articular hyaline cartilage. And this, once again, just helps to smooth that out. So there's some patients that actually suffer from arthritis, uh, which is an inflammation or damage to this hyaline cartilage. And that ultimately ends up uh, causing joint pain because you know the friction is actually like not mitigated uh, with the help of the synovial fluid and that hyaline cartilage to help reduce that wear and tear. And so movement would be like a little bit more painful for those patients, if not a lot more. Uh, but yeah, and as you can see, I've drawn an example here of a tendon. This would be connecting the muscle to the bone itself. Um, and then on the side, we have our ligaments, which are connecting bone to bone. But overall, this is kind of like the image you should have in your head when you're thinking about movable joints. And so I think that pretty much wraps it up now for our skeletal system discussion. If you found this at all useful, please uh, drop a like down and uh, comment if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics that you want me to go over. Uh, I love making these videos. I really love helping people out. They also help me out a lot. Um, and so yeah, I hope, I hope you all have a great day.